In this video, we're gonna be talking a little bit about the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. This camera is brand new, people are starting to receive the camera, a lot of reviews are appearing online, and we're gonna just share a little bit of our thoughts and a little bit of this experience that I had uh, this week when I was shooting with two Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera together with the GH5. So hang on and stay with us to see this discussion. We're not so used to having so many views in our videos and in the previous video that we were talking about the Mac Mini Pro, we had a lot more views and a lot more comments than we are used to. Gabriel, what did you think about that? Well, we've got, uh, right now we've got 2,664 views, 55 comments, 39 thumbs up, uh, no thumbs down, not to jinx it. Uh, Oh, don't yeah. jinx, man. Someone's, someone's just going to go there and click it just because we said I might that. just click it just <laughs> to dissuade everyone else. Um, yeah, it's, it's great to see the view counts and the number of comments. That's wonderful. Um, what makes me nervous is that we're getting these comments on a shorter video than our normal videos that's talking about a piece of tech, whereas our show is normally about pretty in-depth video production conversations. Uh, which is more niche than, than Macintosh computers, Apple computers. So I am a little nervous that we will really like all these clicks and numbers and things like that. But, you know, we've discussed we're, we're not interested in being a gear review show. Lots of other people do that really well. Um, I I just don't want to lose all the new subscribers who jumped in. I don't want them to all be disappointed when the next episode we're talking about video production or uh, how to grow your business and so forth. Yeah, which means in case you are interested in hearing all about that, we have a lot of episodes that are talking about career in general, dealing with clients and a bunch of other things that are business related, video production related. So if you guys enjoy that, join in and of course, if you like whatever it is, the content that we are putting here, subscribe, like, share, and comment in our videos. Okay, um, so what are we talking about today? Well, today, uh, I think we should, we, we had a number of questions and comments on the Mac Mini Pro video um, that maybe we should take a few minutes to uh, respond to before we jump into our uh, official episode topic of the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Um, where do you want to start here? I guess, number one, we've got uh, Martin Film. That's the name of his channel. I subscribe to your channel. Do you guys have a Discord group or the sort? I have one, but for UK DITs, which are about 89 at the moment. Are you a DIT, Felipe, or an editor? Uh, and first of all, a DIT is a digital imaging technician. Uh, they handle a lot of the technical and creative stuff on set. So Felipe, uh, you, you were the one mentioned. Why don't you jump into this one? Like you commented in uh, in in the response there of the comment from Martin, uh, I'm not a professional DIT, but because I haven't been really in a huge production film set, but I do act as a DIT in some smaller productions. So you could say that I do DIT tasks, but when I'm doing DIT, I'm also the editor of of that um, of that project. So you can either say that the editor is taking care of everything, or you can say that the guy is splitting between a DIT and an editor. Um, but those productions, they involve either shooting with uh, DSLRs or Blackmagic cameras or RED cameras. I do shoot with a friend of mine with a, a Red Dragon 6K and a Helium 8K. So it, it really depends on the project. Um, but... We do not have a channel on Discord. Uh, we could be interested in maybe creating a place that we can have some uh, smart uh, conversations and discussions with people uh, as long as everyone stays cordial, I would say. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I barely have enough time even to do the show. Um, so while I would love to just spend a lot of my time engaging in conversation, um, no guarantees that a whole separate channel dedicated just to that is something I'll be able to pull up anytime soon, but you never know. Uh, all right. Next question is from Robin Kurtz. Uh, is it Kurz or Kurtz? It's Kurz. Kurz. Okay. Uh, yeah, German-American. Hey, Robin. Uh, I, I'm sorry, Robin, if I butchered your name. 
<laughs> well, I, I'm very familiar with Robin from uh, various internet channels over the years. Uh, great stuff as usual, guys. Thanks, Robin. Thanks for the, all the continued effort. I would merely contest the notion that the new Mac Mini can actually even come anywhere close to an iMac with Final Cut Pro. 4K editing on it, I highly doubt that it's something you'll want to do yourself. Certainly not without an eGPU. CPU, whether i3, i9, or even Xeon, is pretty much completely irrelevant in the context of working in the Pro apps. Though if proxy, sure. But even then, I wouldn't expect too much real-time performance past your second stream or effect. Same goes for the Air, by the way, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what do you think, Felipe? Um, I, a, a, a lot to unpack there. Yeah. Um, we, we never really directly compared performance at all, I don't think, to an iMac or a, a Mac Pro. It was more the, the number of ports, the expandability, the ability to plug in eGPUs. It was just um, the, the, the 10G connection. Those are the types of things that lend itself to a pro workflow. Wouldn't you say? I mean, because obviously, the, the you know, an i3, I'm not going to want to cut 4K media on an i3 processor. I'm not, I'm not going to get in the merits of the processor because between i3, i5, and i7, there is a lot of just marketing jargon from, from Intel. Uh, there are things that will, will make a difference there. For example, L2, L3 cache and things like that on the, on the processor if they have quick sync or not because the i3 most likely does not have quick sync. I think only the i7 and I... I don't actually not even sure about the i9, but the i7 has quick sync, yeah. so I, I don't want to comment on the i9 and the i3. Most likely, the i3 and i5 do not. But um, when when you come when it comes to editing 4K, first of all, it depends, right? Because even a powerful iMac, not the iMac Pro, but a powerful iMac, if you try to put a GH5 10-bit file there, you're going to be struggling mm. to 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 edit yeah. that. So it will depend on the file, the codec, uh, and the camera source that you're that you're editing. Now, having said that, I used to have a MacBook 12 inch from 2016, the most underpowered Mac computer that there is in the lineup, and I used to to edit 4K videos there, and those were 4K compressed each to 64. Uh, and then one of the reasons for for being able to do that is because uh, on Final Cut, the acceleration is doing by the GPU, correct? Uh, yeah. Correct me if I'm no, wrong. It is. And and those GPUs that are on the MacBook, that are on the Mac Mini, that are on the MacBook Air, they all have hardware acceleration for H.264. Mm -hmm. So the decoding and the encoding were done very quickly there. Um, and on the Mac Mini, the Mac Mini is capable of doing hardware decoding of HEVC 10-bit, so at 4K. Ten, ten, so that's actually not too, bit, too bad. It can do the 10-bit HEVC? It can be the 10-bit HEVC. Okay. Uh, the, the graphics card that is there is the Intel UHT 630. And I was just reading about it today. There is not a lot of difference between the HD630 and the UHD630, but one of the, the core capabilities of that graphics card is that it can do encoding and decoding of HEVC 10-bit. And that's not a bad thing to have, of course. It does not compare to an iMac with an RX 580. Yeah, it does I not compare with a proper GPU but it is possible to add it. Of course, not a raw 4K from yeah. a Blackmagic camera, or from, from a RED camera, probably. Sure. Definitely not from the GH5 10-bit, um, but if you're recording compressed 4K on a DSLR, on a Sony camera, or something like that, uh, it's I, I would say that's possible. Because we don't have a Mac Mini in our hands and we're not doing a review per se, um, and we're not doing benchmarks, it's difficult to say right now. The only way that I say this is just because of the experience having a very underpowered machine cutting on Final Cut, it was possible. So why not on a machine that is way more powerful right now? Well, the other thing I'm, I'm thinking about the Mac Mini is I'm sure someone could buy one spec it up a little bit, maybe say the i7, and they could do plenty of cutting in it. But I think the value really is is taking that device and plugging it into a larger post-production eco ecosystem. Like you said, you know, using a few of them on set for a DIT or a bunch of them as a server or for, as a render farm, it's when you start to connect them with other things is where it really becomes a useful tool. There were a lot of comments here 
that we would love to respond to. Um, it would probably take one or two whole episodes to get through these. So we'll jump into the comments and uh, respond as we can. Um, I'm sure we won't get to everybody, but at the same time, you know, this is this wasn't really a actual review episode. We're just offering our opinions. We're not idiots when it comes to this stuff, but we're just kind of feeling out how things might fit into different workflows and ecosystems. So whatever we say, take with a grain of salt. We're, we're not claiming to be the final word on anything, uh, and we're, we're not. With that said... In having let, that said, right, because we're going to talk about something else now that is very similar. We're going to talk about something else. That's another piece of gear. Um, this is not a gear review. We don't have this device in hand right now. Unless, do you still have it, Felipe? Unfortunately, I don't. I had it only for two days. All right. Well, and that thing is the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K, um, which is a new unit from Blackmagic Design. And uh, it's something I was really, really interested in. I've chosen not to go that route because I shoot with the GH5 and I still feel like I can squeeze more value out of that. And I still feel like I can push that further to get a more cinematic image <laughs> out of it. And I'm also spending that money on a network attached storage or Mac mini instead. So it is something I seriously considered. And yesterday you were able to get your hands on one and play with it a little bit, Felipe. What's what's our, our yeah. big picture view of what this camera is and, and what's exciting about it? Just a little bit about the shoot that I, that I had. I had this three camera shoot where the GH5 was one of the cameras and I had two Blackmagic's Pocket Cinema Camera 4K. Um, it was at a theater, so basically there was one point of light that was a china ball in between two actors, and it's supposed to be them within the darkness and having that, that conversation just there in between them. That is like a comedy sketch, uh, a little bit. And, and one of the reasons why I chose the Blackmagic was, one, I wanted to test it, <laughs> so... I have the opportunity of renting a new camera, so why not this one? Second, because I knew that I was going to be in a very low light scenario with one uh, source of light. I was like, okay, there is. Uh, it's supposed to have better sensitivity to light. Um, so that's another reason I got well, it. Well, and the Black Magic and... was never famous for their low light performance, but now they've got this dual yes. ISO, so you've got two separate native <laughs> ISO levels. Yeah, and most of all, I wanted to get it because of the quality of the image that I'm used to seeing from the Blackmagic Ursa Mini. And I really love that image. I really absolutely love uh, the color science of, of Blackmagic. Yeah. And I wanted to have that for my shoot. And that's what I was expecting when I went to shoot with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. What? That's a huge name. <laughs> Sorry. Let, <laughs> I'm let's, just, let's just call it the Pocket Cinema 4K. Yeah. And well, those are the reasons. Now I got into this shoot and there were several things that, uh, there are a few things I liked and there were many more things that I didn't like about the camera. Let's start with what you liked. The biggest reason to like that camera is the weight, number one. It's extremely light. So if you're dealing with a lot of cameras with a lot of gear that you need to be carrying around, uh, that thing is not gonna weigh you down and it's totally possible to put it in a cage and rig it up and become very big and heavy like it, every other camera. No, it, it's slightly larger than your average DSLR though, correct? It is. It is wider. Wider but lighter. Um, no? In way lighter. Okay. So for example, if you get the GH5 and the Blackmagic next to each other, the Blackmagic feels like a toy. Um, it has that that look that I, I described like a, a mini tank. Sure. Like if it would be the the Batman uh, the Batmobile yeah. from from the, the no Dark Knight, yeah. yes, it, it has more or less that appearance. The way that the the lines and uh, and everything is designed on that camera, so that's the cool part. The second cool part is the screen. The screen is huge. It's a five inch touch screen. That, that's that's something that really appealed to me too. So I I use the seven inch Atomos Ninja Flame, mostly just. So I have a bigger monitor for gauging my image. That can be a bit unwieldy to use. So I was thinking about getting the Ninja 5, which is a 5-inch display. And then this camera comes out with also a 5-inch display. And it's like, huh, I could just use this. But there are a few buts about that screen, aren't there? 
There are. Um, because I was in a very dim lit situation, I was able to use it at 50%, but I don't know how it would behave out in the sunlight. Really, really couldn't say. Um, that screen, be, bef before I get on the bad sides of the screen, I'm going to just continue on the positive sides. Because there is also the Blackmagic um, user interface that, in my opinion, is by far the best user interface amongst all cameras out there. That, to me, it's like the Mac OS of cameras. Yeah, absolutely. That camera, the, the UI is just fantastic. Um, I, I really like it. And I was using it with um, a couple of the lenses that I have for the GH5, and it worked really well. Um, uh, yeah, the interface is good. And the, the, the third thing that, or how many things they say that are good so far? Two. Weight, screen, yeah. The third thing is you can record on SDs. You have a, a, a CFast card in an SD, uh, a CFast slot in an SD mm -hmm. slot, and I was recording with SD in ProRes. So for me, that was great. Can you, you can record all flavors of ProRes? Well, it depends on the card. Uh, I was using a 250 megabytes a second card. I would guess that would go up to 422HQ in UHD. Is that what a V90? Or maybe a little bit more. Is that a V90 card? Uh, it was an a, it was an A data. I don't know if it was a V90. Uh, I should have taken a picture of the SD card. Because a lot of these cards, uh, like for example, to record 400 megabits, megabits per second on the GH5, you need a V90 at least, I believe, and. These cards are really expensive, and that's where the Pocket Cinema Camera 4K gives you another option. You can also output to an SSD. Yeah, these ones, these ones that I was using, I don't think they were the super expensive. They were like in between the the normal price that is like 95 megabytes and the 300 megabytes one. I have the two of them. Okay. I have a, one that's uh, rated at 300 megabytes a second, super fast, and the other one is 150 or 90 me 95 megabytes. Um, but yeah, what you just said, the SD card, uh, you can use an external SSD. But before that, 256 gigabytes in ProRes LT UHD was giving me about 90 minutes of recording. And I would say that's not too bad. Yeah. But it's 256 gigabytes a lot. Well, try, try recording ProRes 4x4 or RAW. That's a different ballgame. Yeah. Um, those are basically all the positives that I saw on the camera. Really? So the actual but, image, you didn't, you weren't happy with the colors? Okay. Yeah. No. Yeah. <laughs> they were black magic colors and I liked them. The thing is, once I put them side by side with the GH5 and I was shooting my GH5 in Vlog L, um, I preferred the, the GH5. Uh, this is super subjective. Yeah. Um, I liked the dynamic range more on the GH5, and people are going to just scream right now at me, like, the Blackmagic has more dynamic range than the GH5. Um, probably. Yeah. But um, I was in a super high contrast scene, and the way that I, uh, the Blackmagic was moving from shadows to mid-tones... I didn't like so much. Uh, I, I found a much nicer role between on, on the GH5 between shadows and mid-tones. Well, that's at the low end. How does it handle? Because the GH5 doesn't handle your highlight roll-off very well, generally. How do the Blackmagic compare on the high end? I, I definitely agree that um, the GH5 in Vlog has kind of a horrible roll-off. Well, uh, a, if you put in HLG... You got four stops above zero and eight stops below. So that's why it shadows a little, little more information. But in HLG, you definitely have a better roll-off on the on the highlights than on in Vlog. Um, and, and that's just the nature of how a HLG works uh, against a log uh, curve. And we're going to probably have an, a video about that. Uh, but the roll-off from highlights to... To mids, I didn't like it either. I found them very flat. Now, is it devil's advocate? Is it possible you didn't expose correctly on the black magic? It's not impossible. The thing is, um, maybe I can actually, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that or not, to put here how the 
raw before color grading image out of the GH5 is and you would be able to see on the forehead here of the lady how everything looks like and then we can lower a little bit the highlights and start doing some color grading and the final image looks pretty much like this um but definitely not overexposed okay devil's advocate <laughs> i suppose yeah because uh, it's tricky i mean it, you see a lot of these tests and people are comparing focus it and it's like well this camera is yeah. not even you didn't even actually pull focus and, uh, so how, how can i evaluate the and, sharpness? and then of course and then of course i use a color checker every time that i'm recording okay. um it it looked fine uh when when i was doing and i was using false color as well uh everything seemed fine and, and and i will say there is detail there i just don't like how it rolls okay from highlights to, to mid-tones uh it could have been just that specific place it could have been uh that specific light which is the same light that i'm using right now so literally Right now, I have almost the same setup that I had before. I have a GH5. The lights that I have here, it is a super cheap setup, which is a, an IKEA China ball with three LED bulbs from IKEA inside. So it's not super color accurate, um, but it's cheap for a low budget um, shoot. But that's about colors and exposure and, and dynamic range, right? Well, it, um, it, it, it's. There is another part of the image that I really didn't What's like, that? which is the, the ISO steps in between the native ISOs. So the lower ISO, it's either 400 or 800. Um, and the other native one is 2,500, if I'm not mistaken. So. If you put your ISO at 2,000, 2,200, you have this absolutely ridiculously awful noise pattern. And, and where with the GH5, I was shooting at 1600 and the noise that I was getting there looked more like grain than color noise. Okay. And on the Blackmagic, it really looked like color noise. That's not good. And 65 is in 99% of the time as high as I would ever go on the GH5. So some people say you can go to 32, whatever, but for me, even 16 is pushing the noise. Uh, but it's not its not the worst noise ever. So hearing that the Black Magic has more color degradation in the, in the noise is, is unsettling. Now, I, if I would have hit 2500, I would have reset all of that sure, noise, yeah. right? And it would be become to the, to the bottom. The thing is, um, <laughs> the way I wanted to look with the lens that I had there, it was 2000, it was 2200. I couldn't increase my light, I couldn't decrease my light because these are not dimmable. Um, I wanted to have my lens at, uh, so the Blackmagic, one of them was at 5.6, the other one was at 5.6 as well. And I didn't want to open the lens more than that. So if you were, if you were running and gunning and you, I mean, obviously you've got your exposure triangle, which should be a square because the fourth one they mentioned, they always fail to mention is that you could just add or subtract light. But, you know, so if you can't really go up or down with the ISO or, or, or if the other things are fixed, you know, it just, uh, it would lead me to believe that the black magic cinema camera maybe isn't the best for run and gun where you have to work quickly and you can't control all those things so precisely. It, it is not that that's, that's where I would say that the negative sides on the black magic comes in is which comes in with the screen very first of all, but um, w with the with the GH5, I know that the increments from 400 to 640 to 800 to 1200 at uh, 1250 to 1600. I know that the increments, uh, the, the way that the noise escalates there, it's really not bad. But the way that the noise was escalating on the Black Magic was really ruining the image. Um, and, and that, that that's one thing that I find where the GH5 is behaving a lot better. Although the GH5 is also not a low light yeah. camera. GH5s maybe, and and again, a, a lot of people might yeah. say, why aren't you comparing the Black Magic to the GH5? Well, we don't have a GH5s to test, so we're just basing this on our own experience. This isn't an official review. So yeah, um, and then if you talk about a run and gun, that's where that's where things start to complicate. Um, in in one in one of my shots in one of my my angles um, 
I had one actor sitting above the other mm. one, like to, to really get that impression that uh, she's, she was above the, the person she was talking to. So I had my black magic uh, above her, over her shoulder, looking at the person. Okay. And that meant that was above my head. And at that moment, you're like, oh, the screen that doesn't move, doesn't swivel, doesn't, doesn't do anything. And that screen off axis doesn't look great. Uh, and it's, you really can't, you really can't count on that screen okay. off axis. Um, and not, not being able to, like, if you bring the camera to your waist level, you don't see anything. If you put it above your head, you don't see anything. If you put, if you put it off to the side, you don't see anything. Uh, or not that you don't see anything. It's like, mm, it's not good. Um, the screen for me was one of the biggest things. Um, battery. Well, I don't think nobody's going to say that the battery life is impressive. It's, it's pretty atrocious. If you ask me, uh, they, they claim an hour. I've not read a single review that says anybody actually got an hour. I, I think if you're going to be on a half a day shoot, so in a four hour shoot, you need to have four or uh, eight to 10 batteries. Yeah, that that's absurd to me. I mean, I, I even the GH5, I would get maybe around two hours on average per battery. And that wasn't good enough for me. So I got a V-mount. I just want to put one and just let it go. I don't want to worry about it. So that would be completely going backwards for me to have to worry about power again like that. Now, I was interested in the Black Magic because of their color science. And I was interested in the dual ISO and... A lot of my shoots are somewhat studio and that they're, they're tripod. I'm not running and gunning. I'm not running around shooting in caves or running in the street. So I could afford theoretically a more controlled environment. But there are still plenty of shoots where, you know, I'm filming a man or a woman, you know, where I need like a 200 meter lens at least to, to see them because they're giving some corporate presentation where I can't add lights and you don't need a cinema camera for that at all. But and the black magic has zero stabilization. It's still it's still noisy. This it's still noisy. Well, I'd be locked down. So again, there, there's that. But it's just I can't add lights in these things. So you know, I did one at downtown Chicago where they had like this ring of light above. It was like the the best lit conference room I've ever been in. And every other shoot I've done in a conference room has been garbage compared to that. And they're just it's low light noise. So again, I it doesn't need to look cinematic. But I can't. I can't spend, this is an hour and a half presentation and I have to run neat video on that and post because the noise is so bad. That means I'm processing for like two straight days. So, and I have enough of those shoots where, you know, I can't, I can't invest in a separate camera system for every type of shoot I do. I need one that's good at all of them. So at the end of the day, the, good at all the of G them? G GH. Well, the GH5, yeah. And I didn't say it's amazing at all of them, but it's good enough at all of them. I, I, I would describe the GH5 uh, as the best average of everything. It's not the sure. best at, at necessarily any of them, but it's the best average of everything. Like, uh, see the fact that we, uh, we are able to do 23, 9, 7, 6. We are able to do 24, real 24. We are able to do 25. All the all the, the, the frame rates, the common frame rates and off speed we can do. And this is a camera that's worldwide. It, it, if you bought it in Europe or in the United States, you can't do all the frame mm -hmm. rates because some cameras like the Sony's, they used to lock uh, by, by region. You don't have record limit, which is for me huge, mainly when we are recording these things that are hours long or you're, you're recording conferences. Yeah. Um, I, I recorded once a conference that was the whole day. The camera was literally on the whole time. And once one card would fill, I would remove that. It was recording on the second one. I would put a brand new one and it was, I was just swapping. The like dual that. card slot is amazing. As, the full size HDMI port is amazing. The uh, internal stabilization, which I've never really benefited from, but uh, it's, it's pretty good. Most people who use I do, it because I, I do a lot of handheld. Yeah, I almost never do handheld. So uh, I, I actually turn it off because when you have it on, when you're on a tripod and you start to pan, it, it, it starts to compensate. It's all messed up. So I, I actually have it off. I've never <laughs> you pan and the camera doesn't. I've pan. never even benefited from having IBIS. So for me, a GH5S would would make sense because it doesn't have it. And I don't I don't really need it. Um, that's neither here nor there. 
who do you think the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 4K is suited for? It's a great camera for someone that's just getting into this right now. Um, and that they need to be behind a camera. Because uh, if they need to be in front of the camera, they're going to need to buy an external monitor so they can see themselves and whatever. Um, uh, the, the entry costs like, what, $1,300 if you buy yeah. it out of BH? Um, that's cheap. Uh, it's almost half the price of a GH5 or a GH5S. So that that's that's huge. It comes with a full version of DaVinci Resolve. Um, so that's another big advantage. DaVinci Resolve costs three hundred dollars, so you're basically getting a camera for three uh, for a thousand and, and DaVinci Resolve for three hundred. So it, it is really cheap there. Uh, the native ISOs, yeah, if you. If you go from native to native, probably it will be very good. I didn't get the chance to go from to the second highest mm-hmm. um, native. Um, well, and that, again, if you're in a studio and you can control those things and you've got light meters and you can set everything up based on a certain stop or ISO, that's fine. But again, in these corporate shoots, I can't adjust the lights. I need my aperture to be at a certain thing because the speaker's moving around. I need them to stay in focus when they're moving around. So I'm stuck. I can only really adjust the ISO. And sometimes I need to go up in a little step from 800 to 1250. And if you can't if you can't do that on the pocket cinema without uh, adding a ton of noise, then... Here it is. Uh, I, w- I will say f- one type of person that this camera is for. It's for that person that does not shoot today, doesn't have any equipment whatsoever, and they don't add it, and they want to start. They're going to need to invest money, right? So if you put 2K there... You get the camera for thirteen hundred. You get one, like get a a a lens like a twelve to thirty five millimeter. Mm-hmm. So you have a, a a good zoom lens there. Um, that will cost you. Oh no, that's actually a very expensive yes, one. Is. The twelve to thirty five is very expensive. You um, get the so fourteen get, to one forty or something. You know. Yeah, something that it's gonna run around three hundred to four hundred dollars. Yeah. So then you, then you're at sixteen seventeen hundred. Um, you buy a microphone for another $100 um, and you buy a very simple LED kit and there it is, $2,000 and you have the edit system, you have the camera, you have a lens, you have a microphone. Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot. You have to buy SD cards yep. and batteries. Yep. And then you need hard drives to back up that media and yeah. the cost will never end. <laughs> Whatever number we throw at you, triple it. But. But if you put an A7 III or a GH5 or a Canon or any camera, the, the cost would definitely be a lot higher, mainly if you're using native lenses. Oh, sure, sure. But I, get, but I also don't want to be, you know, super GH5 centric. Like if we're contrasting what know, that yeah. type of camera can do versus the Blackmagic, I would say you'd be just as happy with a Sony A7S III or a, 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 most of your Canon cameras. But there, there is one nice advantage of the Micro Four Thirds is that you can adapt almost any lens to it. Yeah. Unlike any lens ever made, almost any lens ever made, you can adapt That's to true. it because of the flange distance um, and the coverage of the sensor. But I think those are all the thoughts. In the end of the day, my shoot went fine. I had noise, yes, but I was able to deal with it even without need because what I needed was to crush those blacks to not have a background. And, and to create this very dark atmosphere. So I was able to get rid of, uh, of that noise through color grading. And on top of that, I added grain, yeah. film grain from Film Convert. So in the end of the day, I was able to match the GH5 with the Black Magic, and, and, and it looks good. So you made it work for you, but what if you didn't want to crush the, the blacks, so to speak? What if you wanted to see some... I would have to read... Well, I didn't see that noise on the screen, when I'm when I was shooting. Okay, um, that's interesting because may, maybe on the GH5 I, I, I can tell that that while be, recording that there's going to be noise. Yeah, it could have been my failure because I was taking care of three cameras and audio. Sure, <laughs> uh, it's a lot to take care mm-hmm. of. Um, but if if I would have seen that ugly noise the way I saw on my screen, I, it would have jumped to my face. Um, so. Um, now you said this is great for somebody starting out. I would still suggest that if you are doing a short film or or you're you're doing something that can be very controlled i think this camera would be great for that 
a very controlled almost any camera really but well, this one has a great size true. has a black magic color has it records in ProRes, so it's immediately ready for you to start editing uh, you're not going to need to transcode there um all in all would i buy that camera if i had the money for a big camera <sighs> probably not yeah i i've i'm now convinced as well no for for a big camera so i have one camera for, for me to have a second camera i would prefer to have a better camera that's more flexible so either uh, most likely gh5s so i can take advantage of the dual iso sure. um that would be the the one that i would go of course or an a7 III. that would be another one because the price of the a7 III is really good yeah. if i'm not mistaken it might be actually lower than the gh5s too well, and so sony has the gh5s sony has a few advantages over the gh5s also so i mean they all yeah. have their yeah. their strengths. and the color science is a little bit better right now yeah that's which is good but yeah if you want low light performance you know uh, again add lights if you can if you can't then that's where the, something like the sony would be great because sony is definitely a low light king nobody can really argue with that okay but i guess that's all i had to say about the black magic pocket cinema camera 4k it, it looks like a really nice camera uh, like anything else you need to watch dozens or hundreds of reviews before you make up your mind unless you have money you can just you know, throw away or, you know, certainly rent the camera and try it out yourself. For me, definitely it, rent it. just like we said a couple times already in this episode, it really depends on your workflow and, and what you need to do, what you're shooting. For me, uh, if I got another camera, I would still keep my GH5 for other types of shoots. Uh, it's not going to be this pocket cinema camera 4K. I, I would love something like the Ursa Mini. So I can have a more dedicated, you know, I'm, I'm now at the point where I'm interested in a larger form factor with more tactile buttons and more weight for smoother pans, things like that. Um, drawbacks to that are you can't just sling it around. That's where I'd keep the GH5. So there's no one camera that's going to be per perfect for every situation. And uh, this one is no exception. There are going to be lots and lots of comparisons online. We've seen a number of them. Some are going to look amazing because they'll be in controlled situations and some are going to look horrible. And it, I, I think when it comes to any review, you're going to see the best and the worst and you're not really going to know what to believe. So in the end, you've got to make up your own mind. And the only way to properly do that is to actually use it yourself. So I guess that's all I can really say about that. Okay, so if you guys liked this video, like this content and things like that, Please subscribe to our channel, comment, share, and like this video. So I guess we see you in the next one. See you next time. Bye.